if you're new here, my name is Rahan. I'm a final year medical student and a content creator. So based on thinkstudent.co.uk, medicine is ranked as the seventh hardest degree at university. And I guess this can be subjective and can differ based on the website that you look on. However, one thing that we can be certain of is that medicine will appear somewhere on that list, along with biochemistry, astrophysics and architecture. Side note, architecture is literally always ranked first. I don't understand why. I guess maybe it could be due to the responsibility and I don't know. Leave a comment if you have an idea as to why this might be. But every website basically has architecture as the hardest degree. So when people think of difficult degrees, medicine always crops up. That's one thing for sure. I think there are three main factors which make the medical degree notorious. So content, stamina and the admissions process. What do I mean by this? Well, in content, you've got, you know, the absolute breadth of content that you're expected to learn in a period of a few months. And it literally makes your hair fall out. And then you've got stamina. So medicine is four years if you're lucky. And for others, it can be up to eight years. And that's nearly a third of your life you would have studied to be a doctor, um, which requires a lot of commitment. And finally, we have the admissions process. Now, the admissions process is pretty cutthroat and it does make sense. The admissions departments of universities are in charge of recruiting one of society's most prestigious professionals. And we are in charge of people's lives at the end of the day, in a, especially in a time like the pandemic. You know, so doctors that make those decisions or just generally in terms of healthcare, we make the final decisions. So this leads me on to the topic of this video, efficiency. If you've ever heard of Pareto Principle, I'm sure part of your life has changed. And if not, I hope I can explain what it is today and maybe you can go away and, and use it. To give you a bit of context, Vilfredo Pareto was an Italian economist in the late 19th century who noticed that 80% of land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. Now, if you're a mathematician, you'll know this as the power law distribution. And this law doesn't just apply to Italian land. Microsoft noticed that fixing 20% of bugs removed 80% of their crash of crashes in their systems. And to add to that, in a UN report, they found that the richest 20% held 80% of the world's GDP, which is insane when you come to think of it. By the way, this is just one type of distribution curve and there are plenty of others that you can look, look into in your spare time. I've been at uni for seven years, which means I've tried various revision strategies and time management strategies. And the typical revision process involves making notes from lectures, reading the notes, making questions, making flashcards, or finding questions online. Now, yes, I agree, this may actually be helpful. However, it can be done in fewer steps. And here is where we apply the Pareto principle to how we study. So I'm in final year of medical school and I've actually done a lot more this year than I've managed to do, you know, in the previous five years. Um, I've managed to learn to code. I've applied for the extremely competitive AFP program. I've consistently uploaded videos. I've offered to be a COVID vaccinator. I've taken up paid shifts on the hospital ward. I've prepared for monthly exams. I've maintained or at least tried to maintain as many relationships with friends and family. And I've still found time to binge watch my favorite Egyptian movies on Netflix. Shout out Ahmed Helmi. Now, in previous years, I haven't been able to do half as many of these things that I usually would have, or I'd get lost or I'd you know feel overwhelmed halfway through. This leads me on to the topic of disciplined efficiency. And this year I found a bunch of Anki flashcards online. For around 20 weeks, I created a plan which involved completing a certain specialty before starting the rotation to make sure it enhances my learning. To add to this, I also supplement my studying with a question bank that I paid for online. And I focus on that to refresh my knowledge. So to give you an example, the week that I'm filming this video, I'm actually scheduled to be on a colorectal ward. And the week before, I actually set myself a bunch of gastrointestinal flashcards and questions to get through. 
Now, usually I set myself around 40 questions and flashcards to do each day. So I can split that up. So 20 in the morning and 20 in the afternoon. And that's it. That's my job done. I have a friend who coined the term high yield, where he likes to spend the early hours of the morning doing question banks, spend time at the hospital if he's learning. And if he's not, he gets home as quick as he can to carry on coding. The day would therefore be of high yield. So based on this, if I find that I'm not learning anything being on the ward, my hospital's actually 20 miles away. So instead of leaving, I'll just grab a chair and get through as many cards as possible instead of you know leaving and, and kind of wasting that trip. And usually consultants and registrars are accepting of this. So instead of sitting around doing nothing, they'd rather, they'd rather see me take control of my own learning. And sometimes they actually get involved too. And, you know, we can ask each other questions and or even they do some teaching. So you're probably thinking, how do you even muster the motivation to do that on placement? And the way I see it is, this is the most important part, by the way. The way I see it is that once I've completed 40 cards, I'm free for the rest of the day. And it's also like a game. How early can I complete these 40 cards or 40 questions? So some days I've managed to complete um, the allocated 40 questions by, before I get home because I've had that much free time on the ward, which means the rest of my day at home can be used for whatever I want. So if I have videos to plan, if I've got a script I need to work on, or if there's filming that I need to do for a large project, then I can work on that. I have more time for that. This then leads me on to the final point, universality. And I think it's important to appreciate how universal medicine is. Whether you've studied in India, or Nigeria or Australia, doctors will attempt to find the JVP. This helps when you consider the breadth of medical flashcards or questions or videos that are available to us. And you see, I was lucky enough to find a finals flashcard pack created by a student at Oxford who put them online for free. And then we have the famous Scots Notes for Medicine, who is, you know, rumored to have outsmarted his own medical school exam that they then had to create a separate exam for merit students like himself. But then again, it's just a rumor that my flatmate has started spreading. I'm not sure if it's entirely accurate, but there are so many resources out there and you know, for the different areas of medicine that you're going to be examined on. My initial problem was that I held the misconception that someone else's notes and questions won't cover the topics that my particular lecturer has gone through. Um, but the fundamental flaw in this is the assumption that the lecturer only assesses what they teach. In fact, you'll come to realize they'll ask you whatever the hell they want. And that's the truth of it. So I guess to summarize all of this, stop being so rigid in your studying, find the inefficiencies in your routine. Now I say inefficiencies, please don't take it the wrong way. I'm not trying to say, you know, you're, you're not doing it right. But most importantly, discipline is what really matters because unlike the general university stereotype, you can't actually cram for medical school. You really do need to commit this information to your long-term memory because like I said, you do hold a huge amount of responsibility in the future. And that's when the knowledge will make a difference in the outcome for the patient. And it's quite a privilege to be in this place. So thank you guys for watching. Um, that's all for now. I'll see you guys next week. Actually, a funny story. Um, I was on the COVID ward last week and there's medical doctors are known for the vast amount of knowledge that they store in their brains like and anesthetist actually but there was one particular consultant who he's just like Rahan you come with me because I'm gonna do some teaching and by teaching he meant assessment like it was just a random uncalled for assessment in the middle of a COVID ward there's people dying and I was actually getting quite emotional reading some of these messages from you know their family members and he's here doing an assessment on my physiology knowledge so I actually crammed a lot for first year, which is why I made that mistake. And now I'm sort of telling you guys in this video. But um, as a result, I don't remember a lot of what I learned in first and second year. Um, and that's my problem.
So he's asking me questions, you know, like on the physiology of the lungs. And I can just about remember that the lung has surfactant and, you know, we've got type 1, type 2 pneumocytes. But he's there asking me, you know, what the types of dead space and, and you know, what the pressures in the lungs and, and um, why do we need CPAP? What, does, what effect does it have on the alveoli? And, and I'm just sat there thinking, honestly, I am, first of all, like emotionally drained at how sad this situation is you know the number of pay i was just thinking you know honestly i was not prepared for this i didn't wake up and come here to get grilled on my physiology but yeah anyways i'm i'm waffling